Well, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to another RetroBits live stream. Today we've got an action-packed episode waiting for you. Lots of excitement, I hope. We've got some Commodore 64s to repair, and I have no idea what I'm doing. So I hope you guys are ready to help out because we're going to dive right in to a bunch of C64 repairs, something that I've never done on the stream before. So this should be exciting. It's a rite of passage for all retro YouTubers to repair a Commodore 64. Not necessarily live, but it's something we've never done. And why not do it the hard way and do it live with all the warts, bruises, and mistakes included for all to see. Especially since, honestly, I've not done this very much myself. So it should be very exciting. Anyway, glad you all could make it today. Appreciate you spending your Sunday afternoon or evening with me or morning if that's the case. Hey Kevin, hey Kilroy, good to see you guys here. MMPPO, Zero, good to see you here. Merck, hey Nate, good to see you. Hey Terrapin, everybody in chat, awesome, glad you could make it. So let's introduce the project and I'm gonna try and keep on top of chat today. It's always difficult when you're doing a million different things at once, but I will do my best. And if I miss your message, I apologize in advance, but uh, if it's important, send it again or tag me in chat. That way it'll highlight and I'll see it. Awesome. Am I stocked up on PLAs? Uh, well, I have um, aftermarket PLAs in my own machines that I can pop out and use. Yeah, we've got some bread bins. We've got some 64 Cs. So we've got a variety of different machines. In fact, I see something in there that's neither of those. So uh, Houdini, good to see you. Mark, good to see you. Glad you could all make it. So without further ado, let me introduce to you what we're doing today. So let me just back up here. I hope you all can hear me. If you can get a sound check, that'd be great. This right here is a bin full of Commodore 64s. And as I understand it, each and every one of them is broken. What I've been told is none of them work. Hey, TJ, good to see you. Hello, what is your favorite color? I don't have a favorite color, but um, awesome. Hey, Patrick, latest Commodore 1581 video helped figure out why your build wasn't working. Well, I'm glad it was helpful. Um, I hope you didn't have the power wrong like I did because that was a huge, huge uh, mistake that I'm still angry at myself about killing five of those drives. But hopefully uh, that'll keep other people from making the same mistake. So awesome. Hey, OX, Ox, evening from the UK. Glad you could make it. Awesome. Sound is excellent. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate that. Um, you may notice that I'm not using the standard mic today. I'm using the wireless mic so I can move around a bit. It's on a battery. Uh, hopefully it'll last the duration of the session. We'll find out one way or the other. If it doesn't, I'll switch to the webcam and we can go from there. Um, so I'm going to unpack this box and we'll take a look at what's inside uh, and then we'll decide what we're going to do with each one of these Commodores. So let me just open it up here, get the top off the crate, and let's see what's inside this mystery box of Commodores. Well, first up, we have a bread bin, a little bit faded, but um, yep. Supposedly all of these machines uh, in one way or another do not work. I'm gonna try and find a place to set these down and then we'll decide which one we're gonna work on first. So we've got a bread bin and then we have a really nice looking 64C. Can you see that? It, uh, yeah, it looks really good here. You can uh, have a close up look at that. Yeah, it's a nice 64C. Not very yellowed at all. It's a little bit darker here, but um, yeah, it's in, in great shape. So a, a 64C, that'll be a little bit of a different repair from a standard bread bin. Then what we've got here is a board without a case. And so this is a long board. This would be out of a regular old bread bin as well. Doesn't have a matching case or keyboard to go with it. But the nice thing about this machine, let me get you the overhead cam again, is that pretty much all of the major ICs here are socketed. Not the RAM chips, but all the other stuff is socketed. And it should be relatively easy to diagnose this machine simply because all the chips are in sockets of their own. And this is sort of a um, more cost-reduced machine. It's got the 
um, reduced clock circuitry here on the board. So that should be a more modern machine, maybe less problems with it. We'll check that out. That might be a good place to start, actually. We could start with this one since we don't have to take anything apart. Let me just catch up on the uh, the chat here. Uh, the, the, the Hi from Switzerland. Hey, Blue Moonite. Nice to see you. Thanks for the, uh, joining from Switzerland. Live repairs never go to plan. That is correct. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I've never done a live repair, really. We did a live build that didn't go to plan one time, but uh, yeah, we'll find out what's happening. Patrick says, I built a new C64 using a new PCB in case. It took a few months of tinkering to figure out why it wasn't working. What was wrong with it, Patrick? R4SDI, I don't know what that means. You're gonna have to clue me in. Um, I'm old, so I'm not in touch with everything there. Um, yeah, it was a clean 64. No Sid, yep, the, uh, the Long board that we just looked at does not have a SID. Power Vintage, welcome, welcome. Moss Logic chip spotted. Yeah, yeah, I've got a pile of chips over here that we can replace with. I've got spare boards that we can borrow parts off of. Um, so, yep, no SID, no SID. Volume is a little low. Um, uh, I have the volume all the way up on the microphone. I have the volume all the way up on the slider. Let me just check my sound settings. Actually, um, there may not be anything I can do about that. I have everything maxed out on my end, so you may just have to turn up the volume. And I'll try and keep things quiet when I do uh, screenshots or anything like that, or you know, video capture. Yeah, live repairs. Uh, uh, this is not a great idea, especially since I'm not an expert repairing Commodore 64s. Why are you looking at just the board when I could be uh, talking to you? Um, yeah, I'm not an expert uh, with Commodore 64 repairs. I've done a couple of my own off camera, but um, when you do a, a, a long format video, you can cut out all the errors. You can spend time researching. You can test things at your own leisure. So today it's going to be a little bit different. Um, yeah, so uh, Gal PLA. Oh, okay, you built your own Gal PLA program that didn't work. Yep, okay. Yeah, I'm using a uh, plankton on one of my machines. That one, that one's pretty good for me. Um, yeah, so we'll have a bunch of machines to try. Uh, let's see what else is in this bin. Hello from Germany, Logic Tester. Glad you can make it. We have another 64C here, and this one has some writing on it. We'll take a look at that. It's got a serial number and some warnings on here. This one's a little bit more yellowed than the last one, but still pretty good cosmetic condition. So we've got that there. And then in the case, we have Commodore C16. Um, a little rattling around in there. It doesn't seem very secure, but um, not a 64 at all, the TED machine. Usually, um, if something goes wrong on these, it's probably the TED chip, which is, I don't want to say unobtainium, but it's something I don't really have a spare of. So we may save this for another date because I really don't have parts or the know-how to tackle this machine. So we may put the C16 off to the side. And then there's one more machine in this box. Let me just dig that out here for you guys. And here's another bread bin. This one is very, very clean. This one is nice. It's not too faded. It's all intact. It looks good. So we've got uh, one, two, two bread bins, a long board, two 64Cs, and a Commodore 16 to look at today. So I'm going to stick most of these back into the box and we'll pull them out again. But I think what we'll do, I think what we'll do is we'll start with the bare board because this one seems like a good opportunity. Everything's socketed. We can just hook it up and see what's going on with this board. Um, so yeah, 64Cs are a bit more trouble to repair if the short board PLA is bad since it's hard, hard, fine. And that's true, I don't have a, a special uh, PLA for a short board. A lot of times the short boards have bad RAM chips. Um, hopefully it's something similar, but the uh, short boards use a different RAM chip than the long board machine. So we, we can try and troubleshoot one of those, but we may not be able to fix it on camera today unless we borrow parts from one machine to fix another one. Yep, yep. Um, yeah, C16 dead Ted, that's pretty common. Um, are they all NTSC? I actually don't know. Um, 6567R8, so this is an NTSC machine here that I'm looking at. These were all, let me just tell you the story behind these machines. All these machines came um, to me. They're, they don't belong to me. Um, they belong to a retro enthusiast who lives in my area. His name is Don. 
Um, Don may be here on chat. I, I don't know if he is or not. But um, these machines all belong to Don, who's local to my area and, and an enthusiast. And he said that all of these machines um, are broken. And he's, he's looked at them, at least cursory examination of them, and hasn't uh, determined what's wrong with any of them. But I think Don would like to have at least one working machine out of this pile of, of dead ones. I'm sure we can accommodate that. I'm sure between you guys and me, we can decide what to do and how to fix these things. Because there are a lot of different ways to, to troubleshoot a Commodore 64. Now, I've got all the tools of the trade here. Um, we've got um, soldering iron. Yeah, got the soldering iron here. I've got the desoldering gun, so we can use that. I've got solder. I've got hot air. We need to remove chips. I've got the handheld oscilloscope. This handheld oscilloscope is great if you're trying to troubleshoot something on the go. It has PC software, but the PC software for it really sucks. You get like one hertz sort of refresh rate on the PC. So I did install the software and I decided it doesn't work well enough to, to use it for video capture purposes. So we'll just be looking at the scope itself. But we've got that here. So we've got a, a assortment of tools, a um, dead test cartridge that I've built. Actually, this is a multi-card. It's the Versa 64 card. It's got dead test and it's got the full diagnostic suite on here. So we have that option. So we can test machines by putting chips in other machines. We can test with the dead test. We can test with the multimeter. We can test with the oscilloscope. So a lot of different ways to tackle a broken Commodore 64. And we'll try a variety of different ones today. Um, you know, we'll see how it goes uh, one at a time. Double struck keys on a C64. Yeah, that could be a longboard if it does. Um, double shot, no, no. Yes, this one does. This 64C on the ground has the uh, double shot keys or double printed keys on them. So yeah, it could very well be a longboard inside that one. Um, so yeah, oh, <laughs> this one says NTSC right here. There's no question that this one is an NTSC machine. Um, yeah. I have a, a really cost-reduced 64C with a short board. It's the kind that doesn't even have screws in it. It's just got the plastic clips. So it's like a super, super cost-reduced version. Um, good evening from Scotland. Hey, Retro Crazy, glad you could join us. Yep, C64 dead test cart is going to be quintessential to testing and repairing Commodore 64s. Uh, I do, I didn't mention that. You are absolutely correct. Over here, amongst my, my chips, I have a full diagnostic harness that I built many years ago. So we will give it a shot with this. Once we get it booting and, and working, we can test everything else with the diagnostic harness. Um, so without further ado, I think we've, we've introduced the project. And the, the next thing I want to do is make excuses. Um, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. So I'm going to rely on you guys. We're going to work through this together. Um, and if it all goes according to plan, we may fix one or two or three machines today. We may not. Um, I'm not going to get through them all, that's for sure. But we will do what we can. Kevin says that the uh, one he bought with the uh, that keyboard had the short board as well. You never know. Yeah, they just mixed and matched parts, um, whatever they had on hand uh, from whatever batch of chips and whatever batch of boards. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Bo. Yeah. Kevin is everywhere on, on, on discords. Um, yeah, Kevin's also a, a patron of the channel. So i um, glad to have him here and uh, his expertise in repairing 64s because he's built many a 64 of his own. So it's good that we've got a bunch of people with knowledge here um, to supplement what I don't know. Anyway, we have a whole bunch of options to repair these Commodore 64s. Um, so let us just start at the beginning. Um, so here we go. We've got this board on the bench, and it is missing a SID chip, but everything else is socketed. Now, the first thing that jumps to my mind when we see a machine with a lot of sockets is that over time, the things in the sockets became, become oxidized, the legs, and sometimes we just don't get a good connection between the socket and the pins of the chips even if nothing else is wrong. Now, it's a Commodore 64, chances are there's more things wrong with it than just that. But if you remember uh, my experience with the K-Pro video, I spent an entire episode trying to figure out what was wrong with it, when all that was wrong with it was that one of the disk controller chips needed to be 
reseated in its socket because it had some oxidation. Um, so what I'm going to do, first of all, before anything else, is I'm just going to press down on each one of these chips just to see if they are creaky. And if we need to, I've got contact cleaner, we can pop them out and spray them. But I'm just going to press down on each one of these chips. Nothing yet. A little creaky, that one. Okay, the ROM chips are a little creaky. All right. Oh, this one was a little bit loose. The CIA over here was a little bit loose. I'm not saying that would break the machine. A, a failing CIA would not make the machine unusable completely. So, oh, one other thing I wanted to mention to you guys, and this is really funny. Let me just push this right out of the way. Um, I fully planned to use my wrist strap today, you know, to be grounded, because that just seems like a good idea, right? Check this out. I've got my meter here, continuity mode. You can hear that, right? Put one probe on the grounding strap and another one on the terminal. There's no continuity between the wristband and the strap. If I unplug the strap and test, There's no continuity. So I don't know what piece of junk this is, but um, Arctic Eagle, guys, uh, don't buy Arctic Eagle. If you think you're grounded, you're not. So uh, yeah, I learned that today. We won't be using the grounding strap. I will just be careful. You know, I'm standing on a rubber mat here. I will be careful to touch grounded surfaces before we do anything else. So. Anyway, that was a bit of a surprise this morning when I was setting up to find that that strap doesn't actually strap. Yeah, placebo grounding strap. Yep, that's exactly what it is. Okay, so I've tested all the chips, just pushing them into the sockets, didn't find anything. Actually, while we're in here, let's test this fuse. Always a good thing to test the fuse while you've got your multimeter out, right? Okay, the fuse is good. So we don't need to worry about that. We will do some voltage regulation checks, but as far as I know, all these machines have been connected. All these machines have been tested. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna send it um, and see what happens on the screen, and we'll go from there, okay? Yeah, first repair the strap, yeah. I'm gonna get a new strap. Um, there's continuity, but there's a resistor built into it. Your tester won't, oh, okay, Nikki, good to know, good to know, okay. All right, let's uh, let's revisit that. There's a resistor built into it. I did not know that. So let's test the resistance of this thing instead. All right, got it in resistance mode here. Here we go. I'm just going to clamp on to one end, and we'll test. Oh, okay. One mega ohm. You guys see that? One mega ohm of resistance. Okay. Is that so much that it's going to function, or is that too much? I mean, clearly that's what they intended. Clearly that's what they intended. So we have one mega ohm of resistance, but it does have continuity. Thank you, Nikki. I did not know that. Interesting, interesting. All right, cool. Yeah, one meg resistor, you don't zap yourself. Very cool, okay. Well, we'll do the right thing and we'll wear the strap. <laughs> Strap's too long for me. All right, okay. I'm strapped up, we're good to go. Haha, <laughs> excellent. I, yeah, that's a bit of esoteric knowledge. Um, but we're all here to learn, right? And now we're learning. We've already learned something from Nikki. You haven't learned anything from me, but you've learned something from Nikki. All right, so what I've got here, I've got the uh, video cable. We'll plug this bad boy in. Oop. All right, and uh, I've got the power cable. Let me just zoom out a little bit. Whoa, there we go. Um, got the power cable. I got one of these uh, 90 degree bends so that the power cables don't stick out. I should have got the one that has the uh, the full DIN connector on it instead of the one that's just the pins, but it still works great. Um, you just have to line up the pins carefully before you insert it. Um, but that's really nice because now I don't have cables sticking off in every direction. Um, oh yeah, static electricity can be up to 15 kilovolts, so it makes sense to, to have that. Okay, 
yeah, well, I'm glad I'm grounded now, so excellent. All right, here we go. We've got the capture card turned on. I'm gonna flip the switch. All right. We got nothing but a black screen. Now you can see that white bar. I've intentionally not cropped the video. So the white bar indicates to us that the VIC chip is at least getting power. So we have nothing on the screen, but we do have a white line. So that's good. VIC chip's getting power. Next thing I wanna do with the machine turned on, I'm gonna grab my multimeter and we are going to test the voltages on the voltage regulators just to see if we're making good voltage. So I've got the setting to DC voltage. Let me zoom out a little bit more so you can see my multimeter here. And to test the DC voltages coming out of the voltage regulators, I'm going to just set my probe on the ground plane here. And then we're gonna test uh, pin two of this guy. All right, 12.06, can you guys see that? Yeah, I'm sorry it's upside down for you. It's facing me. But 12.06 uh, on this guy, and pin two on this one, 5.09. All right, so we have good voltage regulation coming out of this thing. We have a functioning VIC to some degree. Next thing I wanna do is just feel around for any chips that are warm. ROM chips, probably not. CIAs, no. We have some MOS logic chips here, these 7708 logic chips. These are LS74, 74 LS something something, um, but made by MOS. Those are common failures. Okay, none of the RAM looks bad, and um, we have Oki RAM. Uh, all eight RAM chips here are made by Oki, so not MOS, not MT. Um, Yeah, nothing is smoking hot. PLA is warm, of course. You know, PLA is warm. Um, but nothing, no smoking gun yet. No smoking gun here. Um, so let's start with the easiest thing first. Before we start just probing lines and, and doing stuff like that, let's throw the dead test in. We're going to do this like the easy way, right? The first, the first repair, we're going to do this the easy way. I'm going to throw the dead test in, and we're going to see what we get. So I've got my, my dead test cart here. This is the, uh, the Versa cart. It's got a bunch of jumpers in there. You can set it to, I've got six different cartridge images on here. I've got the dead test. I've got the 64 diagnostics on here. Right now it's set up for, for dead test. Just got a commercial during the live stream. Yeah, so YouTube is, um, is really pushing commercials these days. And you, as a creator, you can't even turn them off anymore. And you can't choose when they happen in your videos anymore. The YouTube really, really has taken away functionality within the last three months about what you can and can't do for advertising. Um, short of using an ad block or um, using their, their premium subscription. So yeah, it's, it's crazy. But, um, but thanks for supporting the channel all the same. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's bad for live stream because you get desynced from the action. Um, you have to skip ahead. Um, so we've got the dead test here. I'm going to stick it in. Power's off. Okay, cartridge is inserted. Let me cut back over to the machine, and we're going to run the dead test. See what happens. Here we go. Flipping the switch. And nothing, nothing at all. Still very, very dead. So... Even with the dead test, nothing is happening. We don't have any flashing. We don't have any blinking. Um, we don't have any garbage on the screen. So turn it back off. This is the point where we have to suspect that if it's not a RAM issue, then it's going to be something more fundamental with the VIC chip, the PLA chip, of course, or the CPU. Now, you all know <laughs> from uh, C64 Repair uh, 101 that the most common failure is going to be the PLA chip. I mean, that's just the most common thing. Um, yeah, we could check, actually, 
Let's check the uh, the reset signal and we can check the clock. Um, here, one thing I just noticed, we didn't take a very, very close look at this board. Um, let's take a close look at this board real quick. I'm gonna zoom you in as close as I can. And I don't know if this is scorched or if this is, you know, just the way it is, but there's some discoloration here on this crystal oscillator. So what I want to do is I want to throw a probe. Let's start by looking at the reset signal and then let's look at what's coming out of this oscillator and see if there's any clock signal coming out of this. Because if we don't get anything, if this thing is burnt out, then the VIC chip, which generates the, the phi clock and the, and the, the rest of the, the signals for the machine, it won't be able to generate the, the, the clocks and you won't get a functional machine, right? So we need that. Um, check your capture device too. That's a good point. You should always check your capture device before you attempt to repair just to make sure that there's not a problem with the capture device. Um, however, because we saw the black screen with the white line, I know that the VIC is operational. I know the capture device working and I tested it right before the stream started with a known good 64. But that is a very good point. Before you start any repair, you should also make sure that your equipment is working properly, right? Um, flux residue on the crystal. Okay, um, good to know. Yeah, I don't know that crystals just blow up on their own, um, especially since we have good power here. Um, yeah, it, oh, okay, you're getting an NTC image, so the oscillator is okay. All right, thank you, Cheetah. See, this is why we're all working together on this, because like I said, I've only repaired one or two 64s of my own before. So, um, uh, CJ, these all came from a local um, retro enthusiast named Don. He um, dropped these off um, because he's attempted to get a working 64, but all of his 64s are dead. I said that would make good uh, live streaming content, so I'm just helping him out repairing these machines. These aren't my machines. I don't know where they originated from, but these machines belong to Don. He's a local. Um, hopefully Don is able to join us today for this chat. Um, okay, so we know that the crystal is working. Let's check the uh, reset signal, right? Um, that's like the next thing that you wanna do. If the machine, if the reset signal, which is normally high, is pulled low, the machine will always be in reset, right? So let's try that. For that, I'm just gonna bust out the scope here. And again, I apologize that this is gonna be a little bit um, you know, upside down for y'all, but you should still be able to see if there's a, a signal or not. I'm going to connect the ground strap. Um, it doesn't really matter. Connect it to one of these resistors tied to the ground plane. That's fine. Okay, so um, hopefully y'all can see that. And I'm gonna turn the board back on like so. And what we're going to do is we're going to check the reset line of the, the reset line connected to the VIC2 chip here. So let's check this out. This is a 250425, right? Um, 250425. Let's, uh, let's have a look at what 250425 looks like, and we'll get the pin out here. Um, phone 250407, 425. Okay, so this one here. And this is, I'm not sure which one this is. It doesn't have the uh, the other number on it somewhere. Maybe you guys know. I don't see it anywhere. I just see 250425. Well, let's have a look. All right. Um, and we're looking for... U19, which is the VIC chip. Here we go. Um, what is this guy? Nope, that's a SID. Here's the VIC, U19 SID. Um, and the reset signal. Is the reset signal on the SID or does it come out of the PLA? What do you guys think? Where does the reset signal originate? Oh, all right. You can see it here on the SID. It's pin five of the SID. So that's fine. We'll just grab it from there. Pin five of the SID chip, which doesn't exist, but one, we'll flip back here to the overhead cam. This is the SID chip here. One, two, three, four, five. 
Okay? So what we're looking for is for the signal to be pulled low when we turn the machine on for about one second, and then we want to see it jump up to the high state. Okay, cool. So I've got the um, channel one is at 200 millivolts. That was me pulling it off the pin. Um, let's see. Let's change that to uh, 500 millivolts per division. I'm just going to turn it off again and turn it on again. Huh. That's interesting. 500 millivolts per division. Let's change that to 1 volt per division. And turn it on. The reset signal looks good, but it doesn't look like it's going from zero to five at the same time does it let's take a look turn it off turn it on all right make sure i've got the right pin let's try another one let's see what we've got here let's try the cpu let's just test it on the cpu here and where is the CPU? Is it on here or is it on the other one? CPU is going to be U7. VIC2. That's the SID. U17, that's not it. That's the PLA. Uh, maybe the CPU isn't uh, present on this. There's another page. Let's look at page two. Um, for the 250425, let's look at page two. Yeah, all right, there we go, U7. And the reset signal on this guy is pin, that looks like 40. That's kind of hard to read. Sorry, there you go. You agree that pin 40 here is the reset signal on the CPU? So let's have a look at that, and then I'll catch up on the chat. All right, back to the overhead cam. Pin 40 on the CPU. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. So that's pin 40. All right. I'm going to do one volt per division here. I'm going to shut this off. There it goes. There it comes up. All right. Um, yeah. So the reset line is dipping down like you would think it would, but it doesn't dip down to ground or it doesn't come up to five volts. It looks like that sure doesn't look right to me. What do you think? You see that? I have it set to one volt per division, and it's jumping down about half a division. I don't think this thing is going into reset. That's interesting. All right. Well, that is not useful. Let's let's try one more thing here. I want to try disconnecting my long probe and actually probing this like so. Let's try one more time. No, it doesn't look like it's going up to uh to to five volts. It's not being pulled high. If you're not pulling it to high, it's it's constantly in reset, right? Yeah. So we've got something. Something is preventing this thing from getting pulled high. And I did check the voltages here. So we do have a good five volts and a good 12 volts, but the reset signal is never getting pulled high. So the machine is constantly in reset. So it can't run. So what would cause the machine to be constantly in reset? We've got a short somewhere, one of these chips, right? 
Um, we could dig into the schematic and see where reset goes and where it comes from. But I think the first thing that we want to do is just run this machine in a minimal configuration. So you can run a Commodore 64 without the two CIAs, without any of the ROMs. All you need is the CPU, the PLA, and the BIC chip, along with the dead, ted, dead test cartridge. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pull these guys out of the socket. I don't feel anybody getting hot here. But, oh, okay, 8701 is a MOS chip here, right? Reset signal is created with a 556 setup and goes through an inverter U8-7406. No, this is a, yeah, this is a 10X probe. Oh, oh, yeah. No, I have it in, I have it in 10X. Um, oh, you know what? Maybe when I connected this thing to the software, the, the PC software changed the uh, probe settings. Yeah, maybe you're, you're right. Maybe you're right about that. Maybe um, I had the probe in 10X and the software changed. It was in 10X before, but um, maybe not now. Let's do this one more time. Ah, okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Deltix. Let's take a look at this now. All right. Whoa, that's not useful. All right, two volts per division. Ah, there we go. So it's not the Commodore. It's not the Commodore. It was the probe setting. I've always used this with 10X and a 10X probe, but when I connected it to the PC software, the PC software reconfigured the settings on my meter here, my scope. So there we go. Mr. Deltic solved the, the problem, solved the day. Reset signal looks good. Yes, we have a good reset signal. Okay. So I think the next thing to do is still to pop out these guys and see if we can run it with the, uh, the dead test once again. So let me grab a screwdriver. And uh, don't hate me too much for this, okay? Um, but I'm going to use use my little screwdriver here and pop out all these chips. I don't have a chip puller that I love. I have a chip puller, but I prefer to do it this way than use the chip puller because somehow the chip puller always ends up like snapping violently. And it just doesn't, I don't feel like I'm in control when I'm using the chip puller. Whereas I feel like when I'm using a screwdriver, I can apply just the right amount of pressure. I don't have a really nice chip puller. It's a, it's a you know, crappy spring-loaded one. But So a lot of you guys know uh, more than me about Commodore 64 repair. Uh, but for what it's worth, I will explain this anyway why a dead test cartridge can work when you don't have all these chips in the board. If you remember, the predecessor to the Commodore 64, yes, this is a, this is a Harbor Freight. This one comes with the KYB AGX, the ground control AGX adjustable shocks. I've been, I have like dozens of these all over the garage and all over the house. Um, <laughs> Pull the chips to a minimal config. So that's what we're going to do. And then, yeah. Okay, so minimal config. The reason this works at all is because the predecessor to the Commodore 64 was the Ultimax or Commodore Max machine that was sold in Japan. And the Ultimax machine was a very minimal configuration of a machine. It had a VIC-2, it had a SID, and it had a 6502 based processor. I don't know if it was a 6510 or if it was a 6502. Someone in chat may be able to know. Um, the Commodore Max does not have CIAs. It does not have character ROM, basic ROM, or kernel ROM. I'm not sure which order that's in. Um, and it only has 4K of RAM. So when you have a cartridge that expresses the game and XROM lines in such a way that it informs the PLA to boot the machine in, in Ultimax mode, the Commodore becomes 
an Ultimax or Max machine with only 4K of RAM, a CPU, a PLA, and a, uh, I'm sorry, a CPU, a SID, and a uh, VIC-2 chip. And that's how the diagnostic cart works. It's by booting into Ultimax mode. It doesn't use any of these chips because the Ultimax does not have any of those chips. And the Commodore 64 is fully backwards compatible with the Ultimax when booted with those parameters. So what we're gonna do, we'll go back to the capture screen. I've removed those five chips that we don't need. And I've got the test cartridge in once again. And I tested the test cartridge yesterday, so I know that that it works. And uh, let's fire it up one more time. Still nothing. Okay, no flashing. Now, it normally takes a little while before it does anything if it works, but it's, I think this is taking too long. We'll let it run for another second or two, but I think this is already too long. Shall we test some of the voltages while this is going on? Let's test some of the voltages um, on the, uh, the machine while this is running and doing its thing. All right, what we've got, um, I've got the CPU up here and it looks like, it's really hard to read. This is not a good schematic. It looks like ground is pin 21 and VCC is pin five. So uh, pin 21, let's flip it back to here. Let's uh, try pin 21 and pin five, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, all right. If that is to be believed, the CPU is only seeing two volts. Yeah, let me see. We may have a short somewhere. Um, nothing's feeling hot yet. It's been running for a while, right? Yeah, nothing's feeling hot yet. Warm, definitely warm, but nothing's hot yet. So, uh, <laughs> Merck, you noticed that, huh? Yeah. Um, let's see, let's test the voltages on one of these other chips, just to make sure. If that's, if that's true, something is shorting and uh, drawing, drawing too much voltage, even though I don't feel anything hot. Well, let's try the CIA. So pin one and uh, pin 24 on the CIA. So let's do that. I've got pin one, and let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 20. And what did I say it was? Pin one and pin 24, one, two, three, four. Okay, so those two pins there. Oh, let's do the little, move it on. Okay, so yeah, I've got them backwards, but uh, 4.72. Is 4.72 volts enough to run the Commodore 64? That's the question. Feels like um, we've got weird voltages here. On the CIA, it seems like it was different than on the CPU. Let's make sure I did this right. Ground is 21 and VCC is five on the CPU. So, One, two, three, four, five. I got to turn it on. I only have two hands. Yeah, two volts on the CPU. Definitely not enough to run the uh, the CPU, right? Two volts, no good. We've got five volts over here, two volts over here. Something is, is drawing too much power. Something is shorting. Let's take a closer look at this machine. Anything jump out as being obviously wrong with it? Anything broken, anything smoldering, anything burnt? These ceramic caps are all flattened, but they're not usually a problem. These things don't generally need to be recapped. Um, not usually an issue. It's not the power switch, right? Because we tested the two voltage regulators and the two voltage regulators, um, VCC is six. Did I read that wrong? In my, in my diagram here on the, uh, the 6510 U7, it looks like that says 
That might not be. Am I wrong? Ground is 21. And is that not pin 5 for the voltage? Oh, no, it's pin 6. Yes, it's right there. I, I confused this blob of garbage with, um, with uh, this blob of garbage. Okay, pin 6. Very good, very good. Okay, thank you. We'll try pin 6 instead. <laughs> that may make all the difference. All right, so we've got uh, pin, what did I say? Pin 6 and pin 1. Ground is... Ground is pin 21. Okay, so turn it back on. Here's pin 21. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Of course, it would help if I had the multimeter out so you all could see it. The only thing that, uh, you know, is hard about live is everything. Okay, 4.75. Once again, is 4.75 enough to run this machine? Voltage regulator, putting out 5.09. Voltage regulator, putting out 12.06. So the voltage regulators are doing their job, but something, something is drawing too much power. Yeah, okay. So Bo is asking which five volt source powers the CPU? The PS or the onboard regulator? Uh, should mention, since uh, it's a good question, that I'm using a modern power supply here that I tested you know, earlier today. This power supply provides more than an adequate amount of juice for this machine. Um, so shouldn't be a problem with the power supply. Now the VIC is getting a bit hot. You guys want to test this VIC in a... Um, the weird pin on the right side of U20. All right, which one's U20? Looking for it. Oh, here we go, U20. This guy here is a weird pin on the right side of U20. Oh, you mean how this pin looks like it's, uh, yeah, it doesn't look like it's connected to that uh, test point. But is this the one you're talking about? Yeah. Well, the PLA is warm. It's not burning to the touch, but it's definitely warm. Um, you know, these things tend to, to, to short or die. Let's find out if this PLA is... Actually, it's not the PLA. Is Yeah, the PLA. Just for fun, let's pop the PLA and throw in a modern replacement, shall we? Oh, uh, I barely needed to lift that with the screwdriver. Huh, okay, this uh, it's just been out of the socket before, that's all. It's just been out of the socket. Nothing unusual there. Okay, here's what I'm gonna do. Just because that's always kind of the suspect thing, I'm gonna grab one of my own boards here that's got the uh, plankton PLA. Since we're gonna use this probably a bunch of times in this live stream, let us just go ahead and throw the plankton in place. Okay, this is the PLA U17 right here, right? U17, let's double check my work. We don't wanna put the, uh, the PLA in the wrong place, even though I just literally just removed it. Right. Yeah, U17 is the PLA. Double checked. Okay. All right. Got the plankton in. Um, let's just fire it up with the dead test once again. Put that in there. Here we go. Yeah, no surprise. Okay, VCC voltage of 4.75 is within spec. Okay, cool. So it's not the PLA. Interesting. Interesting. Well, 
we have two choices. We can try the, uh, the PLA, the VIC, and the CPU in a known good working machine. Uh, what is the PLA for the uh, noob? Uh, it's the programmable logic array. The, the job of the PLA is to take, there are three signals from the CPU um, and two signals from the cartridge port that allow the PLA to basically generate chip select signals. So what happens is you've got more than 64K worth of addressable things on a Commodore 64. So you have 64K of RAM, but you also have three ROM chips. You have the cartridge port, you've got the VIC, um, there's registers in various places. And so in order for the CPU to be able to talk to all of those things, even though the CPU can only address 64K, the PLA decides what can talk on the bus at any given time based on the, the those signals coming from uh, the CPU and the cartridge port. So that's what the programmable logic array does. Okay. Yeah, PLA and SID socket would definitely pop things. That's a good thing that I double checked it, right? Um, okay. 8701 is also a culprit. Let's check. Everybody's saying the 8701 is the clock running. So let me put the original PLA back in since nothing seems to have changed. Um, I'll put the original PLA back in. This socket is very, very loose. Did you see that? I can just, like, this socket is super, super loose. Let me just, let me just. That didn't make any difference. All right, let's check the clock. You guys want to see if the clock is running? Let's check the 8701. Um, let me find that on the schematic. Let's go over here and see where the 8701 is on the schematic. I don't know which page it is. This thing has two pages. Um, it is U31. Um, so let's see if it shows up here. U13, U14, U26. It might be on the other page. Yeah, let me try the other page here. We're looking for U31. This guy? What does it say? That's U20. Ah, U31, here we go. Okay, so this is the uh, the clock chip, the clock generator. It is the it is a Moss 8701. So let's uh yeah no uh, that's crazy 98 concurrent viewers um, that's more than double like what we've had in the past and I don't know what I'm doing guys I'm totally relying on you <laughs> to help me through this this is not a, a simple diagnostic because this machine is so um, uh, unresponsive to to the normal things yeah we'll we'll check the uh, the data bus lines and the RAM chip. We'll see if the chip select lines are working. But first of all, let's check the clock signal since that seems like a good, a good thing to do. So here we have uh, U31, which is the MOS 8701. And what it's got is a couple grounds here and here. Um, it generates the uh, dot clock on pin seven. So let's start by looking at the, uh, the dot clock on pin seven. That seems like as good a thing to do as any. Turn back on my thing. Get out my probe. All right, clamp on to a ground. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's gonna be the dot clock. Let me zoom out so you guys can see the scope. There we go. All right, we're gonna turn on this machine with the dead test. We're looking at the dot clock of the MOS 8701, the clock generator. All right. We've got a little ripple here. Let's zoom in. Let me change the uh, the time here. We have 50 nanoseconds, 20 nanoseconds. That's a smooth line there. Um, what I can do is I can go and turn on the settings for, let's take a look. Um, Let's take and turn on the references here. I want to turn on, that's not what I want to do. That's not what I want to do. I want to keep pushing buttons. Measurements, right? Okay, we want to do the frequency measurement. Um, we want to look at the peak to peak. 
320 millivolts. Okay, peak-to-peak, uh, -peak, 320 millivolts. That's definitely not enough for a clock signal. You guys can't probably see that, um, but I've got the measurement turned on. This is what it looks like. It's generating, it's, it's outputting voltage um, with two volts per division. It's generating about three and a half volts and it's only um, has a peak to peak frequency uh, voltage of 320 millivolts with no measurable frequency. So if I'm on the right pin, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and if we go back to Firefox and we look here um, in the browser, pin seven is the dot clock, right? Pin seven is the dot clock. So we're not generating that. Um, and then pin two is frequency C-O-N-T. I'm not sure. What is pin two, frequency C-O-N-T? What does that stand for? Let's look at pin two. Um, also, nothing. Um, one, it's, it's not generating anything. So let me turn it off. And uh, we may be onto something here if we're not generating any kind of clock. Um, let's pop out the 8701 and um, find a replacement for this bad boy. Since it's not seeming to generate anything. Now, the fact that it's not generating a signal may be related to another failure. It may not be. But this is a MOS chip. This is an 8701 made by MOS. So there's a good chance that this failure is. There we go, 8701 is out. Let me pull out my working machine here and pull off the can. Um, I hate removing these cans. It's like, you know, it's just begging you to like hurt your fingers or something. There we go. Um, oh, oh. Yeah, no, mine isn't. Mine's not a cost reduced board. It doesn't have that chip there. Um, okay, let's see if we can find it on some other board. I've got another machine here. Parts board. Let's see what we got. Pin six is the dot clock. Make sure I did it right. Put it back in. Make sure I've got it the right way around. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see that. The pins are really crusty there. I'm gonna spray some contact cleaner in there. That just seems like a good thing to do when you've got kind of crusty pins like that. All right, let's get this bad boy back installed. Okay, there we go. All right. Now, let's catch back up on the chat. Should see it jump between zero and five volts. All right. Um, pin two is supply voltage. Pin six is the dot clock. Pin seven is PAL NTSC. All right, let's check pin six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Got that there. Boop. Okay. All right. So we have um, a frequency of seven to eight megahertz on that uh, on pin six, so that looks good, right? Um, so we do have uh, we have something going on here with the dot clock. Let me switch over to the video capture. Still not doing anything though. Still not doing anything. All right. Okay. Well, that's good. At least we uh, verified that the the chip is generating a clock signal. Okay. Catching up on chat. Yeah, it's a dusty board. This one was just sitting kind of out in the open. Um, try pin six. Okay, yeah, 8.18 .8 megahertz um, should be. So yeah, we, we saw that. That's good. Great. So we have a good clock signal, but nothing else is working still. Okay. Well, what should we try next? Do you want to probe some data lines? Or do you want to try these chips in a different machine and see if all of these chips are working?
Anything on pin one of the CPU? Okay, let's take a look at the CPU once again. And uh, what is pin one on the CPU? Oh, okay, that's the uh, the the phi phi in on pin one. Okay, let's take a look. Why not? Why not? Pin one on the CPU. Clamp my probe again here. Turn it on. Oh, and I've come undone. I've come undone. This thing has a very short uh, probe. Pin one on the CPU. Okay. Let's uh, change the time scale a little bit here. Okay, there we go. Yeah, that looks good. That looks good. We can do the uh, the measurement again here, right? We can turn on the uh, measurements and let's look at the uh, frequency and the um, peak to peak on pin one. Yep, frequency is one megahertz, 1.02 megahertz. So we've got a good, and the peak to peak is 4.4 uh, volts. So it looks like the, uh, the, the phi to the CPU is working. This machine, um, this is a uh, plankton. The one that I pulled out is a plankton. I, um, I have a real SID on that other machine. So the only thing that I had pulled off um, is this reproduction PLA. Yep. Without a dot clock, you're not gonna be getting a valid video signal. I mean, it's all black, but it looks like the VIC is generating NTC. Yeah, so yeah, we, we saw that we have a good dot clock. We are generating a video signal. The VIC doesn't seem to be the problem. The PLA doesn't seem to be the problem. The only other thing that's preventing the dead test from running really is gonna be the CPU. Shall we just uh, throw a CPU in and see if the, that's the problem? I mean, if it's not running code, it's not running code. Let's, let's probe the CPU a little bit more before we just uh, decide to throw it out. So let's take a look at some of the data lines on the CPU. Um, you know, that seems like a good thing to do, right? Before we go any further, I'm going to untangle. Nothing worse than having a tangle of wires, right, guys? Your desk is completely covered in a variety of instruments, and they're all tangled up. That's never any fun. Okay. I just want to have a little bit more flexibility with what I'm doing. All right. So I've got my probe. Let's probe some of the address lines and data lines on the CPU. Starting with, uh, let's start with pin uh, seven. Seven looks like the start of the address lines. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Turn it on. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right. All right. We have uh, strobing on that address line. Yep, we've got something there. Let me zoom out a little bit more here. Okay, yep. Yeah. Sorry if you guys can't see that too well. Let's continue down the line. Yep, yeah, we have stuff on the address line. So the CPU looks like it's it's addressing things, right? Okay, let's check out some of the data lines. Uh, data lines start on the high end. So uh, D0 is 37 and then it counts down. So this is what, a 40 pin package? 40, 39, 38, 37. All right. Some of the data lines look like they've got activity and a lot of the data lines don't look like they've got, it seems like half and half. Are they sequential? Let's take a look. 37, 36, 35, 34, 33, 32, 31, and 30. So 20, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's data. There's data. There's data. There's no data. There's data. Nothing. Huh. 
Interesting. So some of the lines have stuff on them and some don't. Okay. Um, I'm not sure that the dead test needs that 4K of RAM to work. That's a good question. I'm not sure the answer to that question. Um, well, let's swap out the 6510 and uh, we'll, we'll test a, another 65. You know what? Let me get out my known working machine and we're just going to try uh, these chips in my known working machine. That way we'll just be certain that the CPU is working and we know that it's working. Um, you know. So in order to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to unplug power here. Unplug video. I'm going to pop out the uh, 6510. This is sort of, you know, if this doesn't work, nothing's going to work. All right, so I've got the 6510. Just going to set this off to the side for a moment here. Set you off to the side. What I'm going to do is I'm going to grab, the reason I'm going to grab this one, here's my Evo 64, and the reason I'm going to grab this one is because it has zip sockets on them. So let's just pop out the 6510 from there, and we'll pop in this 6510. Make sure all the pins are good. Yep, pins look fine. Goes right in, close it right up. There we go, power to the people. All right, guys, what do you think? CPU swap. Here goes nothing. Aha! We got nothing. All right, just to prove the point, guys, let me take the CPU back out, set it off to the side, take my CPU, set it in, go back to the uh, video capture, and there we go. So my machine does work. My CPU works. This CPU does not work. All right, we're making progress. We're making progress. What I'm going to do is I'll take out my CPU and we'll test it in the bad machine. Okay, got my CPU. Let's disconnect everything here. Take this, set it down here. Bring back the board. Take my CPU. This guy is a uh, MOS 6510 CBM from 84, 0384. All right. So, CPU goes in. Nice, nice. Diag cartridge goes in. That goes in. This goes in. Capture board's up. All right, guys, moment of truth. What do you think? Place your bets now. Okay, we have a dead test. We have a working machine, at least enough to do the dead test. Test the RAM. Let's let it run through its, uh, you know, 4K test. This is really the board <laughs> running. So we have a dead 6510 CPU here. Some of the address lines, some of the data lines weren't doing anything. All right, let me get out the old Sharpie. You know what it's time for? Write a big old X on that 6510. There we go. All right, we're making progress. Let's put all the rest of the chips back in this thing. I'm gonna shut it off. Um, I'm not upscaling at all. It's just capturing at native NTC, NTSC resolution. It's a, uh, it's a StarTech USB 3 capture board from several years ago. I don't have any fancy upscalers. Okay, let's wheel in on this bad boy here. We've got our dead CPU. Boom, boom, boom. 
yeah, the, the pause at the beginning is definitely very nail biting. You don't know what's going to happen. All right, I'm going to put in all the other chips and then we're going to see if we can just boot to basic. We're going to send it. Um, okay. I laid them all out in the order that they were, the ROM chips and everything. So it's just a matter of getting them back in without bending any legs. All right, there's one. And there's two. Yeah, I don't remember which one is kernel basic and, and character ROMs, um, but you know, they're these guys. They're these guys. All right, CIAs one and two. I'm sorry I'm using abbreviations that some of y'all won't be familiar with. The CIA is the uh, complex interface adapter. It handles all the serial ports, disk drives, joystick ports, that kind of stuff. ROM chips obviously handle the, uh, the, the program code that runs BASIC and runs the, uh, the operating system and displays the characters. Um, that's what those are all about. 6510s are less, uh, they're not that hard to come by, but they don't make them anymore. They make 6502s and there's an adapter board you can use to put the 6502 in where a 6510 is expected. So it's not the end of the world. Um, date code on the faulty 6510 looks to be um, 18th week of 1982. So uh, pretty early Commodore 64, because um, 82 was the, uh, the year they came out. So the 18th week of the first year of the Commodore 64. So the very early 6510 CPU there. Okay, so I've got Everything in here except the SID, which there was no SID. I'm going to pop out the dead test. And uh, yeah, if you if you get the adapter board, then you can just use a, um, a 6502 that's modern. They're still being made today by the uh, Western Design Center. Okay, we've got the machine here. I'm going to wheel it out. I'm going to flip the switch. We're going to see what happens with no dead test. Okay, we're still not in the clear, guys. We're still not in the clear. We know we have a good video chip. We know we have a good CPU now with the swap CPU. We know we have a, a working PLA, but one of these ROMs is probably not working because the machine did not boot. Okay, so there's more than one failure. We also could have a RAM failure. That's not unsurprising. If one thing is dead, there's usually more than one. Let's put the dead test back in and fire it up again. Oh, okay, we've got a brown screen now. Interesting. So we've got a brown screen with all the other chips back in. So one of these chips that I just installed, one of these five chips is uh, doing something wonky. Yeah, and if there's no kernel, then it's not gonna be able to boot an operating system. Um, character ROM being bad, you would see garbage on the screen most likely. Um, basic ROM, you wouldn't be able to, to run any, any software on um, basic. So, uh, yeah, I've got the dead test in and nothing is running. Um, the dead test is in, and with these chips installed, something is still wrong. So we have more than one failure on this board. Interesting. Okay, very cool. So it wouldn't be that easy. You know, we, we uh, can't have everything go our way. So um, what shall we do? How do we know, I guess we can probe the data lines of each of these ROM chips and see if any of these data lines are doing wonky stuff. I think that's the next thing that we want to do to figure out which of these ROMs is bad, right? So let us turn off the machine. I'm going to set the, uh, the dead CPU over there for the time being. Get back out our scope. And uh, let's switch over to our, di let's take a look at our diagram again. Find those three ROM chips and figure out what lines do what. Here we go. Three ROM chips. So U3 is the basic ROM. Um, which one is U3? Uh, U5. U3. Okay, the basic ROM. And the basic ROM is 2364A. Make sure we've got the right one. This one says 2484. Is 24? No, that's just the, the, the year. Um, huh. This is interesting. I'm going to wheel you back in here um, just to take a look at these ROM chips. Um, they've got some, some residual crud on them. Let's wash the residual crud on them off with a little bit of uh, IPA here. I'm just going to clean this up. I've got um, 
paper towel. I've got a little bottle of IPA. Just we want to get a close look at what's written on these chips because they're all different. Get some of that old, what do we call it? The uh, thermal paste off of these guys. Okay, there we go. Cleaned up. Now, this one's Moss, 1982. Uh, copyright 1982, but it's from uh, the 21st week of 84. This one's a replacement. It's from GI Taiwan. It still says CBM on it, so it's um, you know, it's a different manufacturer, but it says 1984 on it, or 84th, uh, 23rd week of 84. And this one's Moss um, from the 27th week of 84. So we've got a variety of, of stuff here. They're all these two are all the same uh, within the same couple weeks. This one's a little bit weird. It's still in the same time range, but it's got a different stamp on it altogether. That's weird. Now, how do you know a ROM chip is good? Uh, we could throw it into an, an EEPROM reader and actually read it off, uh, but I don't have the EEPROM reader set up here on the bench, so I would have to go do that off camera, which I'm not going to do. So let's just do, um, yeah, we could, uh, let's, let's just probe some of the lines real quick, and then we'll figure out if, if we can see anyone that's obviously bad, and then we'll swap them one at a time if, if we can. So let's do that. Let's just have, since we're here to learn, we might as well do it the hard way, right? But we have votes. People are voting on Kernel. Take your, uh, take your pick now. Vote on what you think it is. Kernel ROM, basic ROM, or character ROM. What do you guys think the problem is? And um, so what do we got? We've got address lines. We've got data lines. The data lines on these guys go from pin 9, 10, 11, skips 12. 9, 10, 11, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. So we'll start with 9 and we'll go to 17, skipping pin 12. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And we're going to skip pin 12. All right. So these are the data lines on each of the, uh, the chips. I'm going to wheel you out again so you can see the scope. Here we go. Flip it on. All right. We've got, uh, we've got data on pin 9. We've got data on pin 10, 11, uh, yeah, okay. 12 we have to skip, 12 there's nothing on 12. Pin 13, pin 14, pin 15, oh, whoa, hang on, what's pin 15? What are we looking at here on pin 15? Okay, 15 is uh, data line 5. And data line five is, is held high, but occasionally dipping low. Whereas if we look at pin 14, it's low, occasionally dipping high. Pin 15 is doing the opposite. And if we take a look uh, over here on the, the ROM, uh, pin 15 here is data five, right? Yeah, okay. The ROMs could be in the wrong socket. Let's take a look at that too. They may have been that way. Um, but this one definitely looks weird because it's the line is held high and it's dipping low. But let's let's verify we've got everything in the right socket. Otherwise, this chip is already um, suspect because the data line is doing something wonky. Um, okay, so this is 9012601. How can you tell which one is a... Uh, well, I guess we'll have to Google it. 901-226. Basic ROM, 901-226. And according to um, the sheet, the basic ROM is in U3. So that's good. Okay, let's look at 901-225. 901-225. No search result. 901-225. Um, 264-901-225. Character ROM. Okay. Character ROM. And so if we go back to our sheet, um, this is the character ROM. Yeah. So I think they're all in the right place. I think they're in the right place. I think those guys are okay. They're in the right socket. Yeah. Yeah, they're in the correct socket. 
data lines are shared, so it could be any one of them. Okay, thank you, Cheetah. Yep, yep, I believe it. The data bus is shared. Um, same thing with the RAM chips, right? The data bus is shared. So if you see a problem, you see it across all of them. Somebody is holding the data bus high on these ROM chips. And so um, what we're going to do is we're just going to have to, because I can't pull them out and test them without my uh, EEPROM tester, which is upstairs. We're going to just have to uh, see what replacements we have on hand. For that, I will grab my trusty board here, and I have one. I have one socketed, one socketed ROM chip, 901227. So I have, I have a kernel ROM. I have a socketed kernel ROM on this machine. So let's swap the kernel ROM because that's what everybody's guessing, right? It's the kernel ROM. So let's swap the kernel ROM with the one on my machine that is socketed, and we'll see if that solves the problem. Yeah, I can do them one at a time and see if the dead test starts. That's also a good point. That's a great point. But since we're all betting on kernel, let's try the kernel ROM. Let's try replacing the kernel ROM. I'm just popping it out of my machine here. There we go. Kernel ROM's out. Kernel ROM's in. I'm going to remove the dead test. Okay. And we're going to fire it up. Oh, it's not the kernel ROM. Not the kernel ROM. Or, or there's other problems. Okay, so put the dead test back in with the kernel ROM, with the replacement kernel ROM. And uh, let's fire it up with the dead test. Brown screen wasn't the kernel ROM. Okay. All right, we're making progress here. We're making progress here. Process of elimination. Thanks, Mossy Bank. Glad to have you here. Glad you guys are enjoying this. I don't know what I'm doing, but we're working through it together, and that's the important thing. Okay, so the kernel ROM was not the bad, bad chip. So I'm going to replace the kernel ROM with the original using my trusty Harbor Freight screwdriver, as TJ pointed out. Put it back in mine. Okay, set that out of here. We're going to put the kernel ROM back in and we're going to take out the next guess is the basic ROM. We're going to take out the basic ROM because we're not getting weird characters, but any one of them could be bad. The basic ROM is U3, the one on the left there. So let's pop out basic. Basic ROM's out. Switch over to the uh, the video capture screen. We've got dead test in. Let's flip the switch. Oh, it's brown. Okay. Maybe not the basic ROM, guys. Maybe it's the character ROM. But I'm going to give it a second just to see if it starts doing anything because, you know, the dead test takes a while to actually start running code. Yep. Yeah, pick the worst board of them all, right? Couldn't just be swapping a PLA. It had to be a whole bunch of other stuff. All right. Nothing's happening. So I'm going to put the basic ROM back in. And we're going to try to take out the character ROM last. There we go. Oh, glad to hear it, Yagi. Thank you so much. I do appreciate that. Here we go. Oh, it's not. Oh, it's pink. It's not brown. It's pink. Does that mean we have more than one bad ROM? Do you think? Could that be? No, that can't be. There's no way. Okay. All right. So let me pull out all three ROMs and make sure that we're back to the state where the dead test is actually running. Because this is starting to get... In my head, when I see a solid color on a C64, that tells me the PLA is, is broken. And if, if the PLA is doing something, selecting, you know, things that it shouldn't be, 
then we're going to get this situation. So I'm pulling out all three of the ROMs, and we're going to boot the dead test again, and then I'm going to put them back in one at a time. Yeah, yeah, we didn't check the CIAs, and they, they talk on the data bus, right? Of course, yeah, CIAs, usually the least suspect chip. When you get a bad CIA, usually it's just like, oh, the keyboard doesn't work right, or, you know, the, the serial port doesn't work right. Okay, the three ROMs are out. Let's power it up. Okay, no colors, no colors. There it is. Okay, so the machine is running, the CPU is running with no ROMs installed. Okay, all right. Well, let's put the most important one in. Let's put the kernel ROM in. Uh, sure, I mean, I put these chips in and out a bunch of times, but um, <laughs> aux is calling for deoxit, so we'll, we'll do that. Why not? Well, there's a lot. Suddenly there was none, and then all of a sudden there was a lot. I guess it depends on on the uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, I do have a, a, a harness. I have a full harness, and we can use that once we get past identifying you know um, what chips are or are, are keeping it from booting because the machine won't boot into a state. Remember that the diagnostic cartridge doesn't use Ultimax mode because the diagnostic cartridge needs access to all of the RAM. So diagnostic cartridge is a regular eight kilobyte uh, Commodore 64 cartridge um, that loads into uh, the high cartridge uh, bank. Oh, no, I wanna, do, I wanna do one at a time. I don't know why I just put both of them in. I'm gonna do one at a time. Why would all of the ROMs go bad? Yeah. All right, I'm gonna do just one. I put in the basic ROM. Let's see if it still boots with the basic ROM in. PSU is um, a, a modern Commodore 64 uh, power supply, but yeah, if, if a bad PSU was applied to this, it could have blown out a bunch of stuff, for sure, for sure. Okay, we have just the basic ROM in and the machine is running the dead test. Okay, let's put back in the kernel ROM. We already, we already verified that the kernel ROM wasn't the problem, right? It's in. We got a black. Oh, oh, ha ha. No, we didn't. Okay. Pink screen with the kernel ROM. Pink screen with the kernel ROM. This is very weird. Didn't we already eliminate the kernel ROM as a possibility by putting my good kernel ROM into here? All right. Kernel ROM's coming back out, and we're going to put in the character ROM. Okay, guys, I'm starting to get a suspicion. Now, hear me out. Hear me out. That when we have one ROM chip in here, it's working. Okay, we've got two ROM chips in here. Let's see if it's working. Okay, it's working with two ROM chips. Didn't we try? my kernel ROM in this machine. I guess we have to try it again because we didn't try it with the dead test, right? We tried it to see if we could boot to basic. Something's wrong with this kernel ROM, okay? Um, all right, well, we've eliminated that possibility. Let's try mine one more time, my 227. That is the right chip, 227. Yep, here we go. My kernel ROM going in. The only difference now is it's got deoxid in there. Okay, okay, I saw a flash. Okay, okay, we have uh, uh, one flash. So now we, we've moved on. We've identified that this has a bad kernel ROM and we've gotten to a, a single flash state. Very cool. All right, this board is truly the board from hell, guys. We have found a bad CPU. We have found a bad kernel ROM. And now we have bad RAM or something like that. So let us continue. 
Let me see if I've got a spare kernel room. Hmm. This board doesn't have one that's this socketed, unfortunately. All right. And my Evo 64, all the ROMs are consolidated onto a single modern EEPROM. So I'm going to have to just remember that this has my CPU and my kernel ROM in it right now. So uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that um, in a bit. So, okay, cool. So now we have one flash. Let's go back to our, um, our browser here and let's take a look at what one flash means um, on a C64 rev A and B. So this is a long board C64 and we have one flashing uh, flash code that indicates that it's U12, okay? And if we look on the board, U12, is this RAM chip here. Now, it can be deceiving. It can be deceiving. Sometimes, sometimes it says one thing, but it's actually not that thing. Sometimes it's other things, right? But this is an easy thing to fix, or at least to test. Yeah, let's run through. Well, okay, we'll run the dead test through, but first thing I wanna see is if it, with the bad RAM, if it can boot to basic or if it can do anything. So let me pull out the dead test, see if it can run to basic at all. Nope, can't boot to basic. So one of our RAM chips is probably dead, but yeah, let's run, let's run through the, uh, the dead test all the way. Yeah, that's a good call. Well, you can't run through the dead test because we're getting the one flashing screen now, right? Yeah, yeah. When I have the ROM out, then we got, with the kernel ROM out of the machine, we got the dead test to run. So let me pop it back out and run the dead test all the way through just to see if it says anything revealing, right? Let's run the dead test all the way through. With no kernel ROM, we weren't getting the flashing. Yeah, let's run through this whole thing. And then we can start inspecting what, uh, what might be sharing a data line with, uh, with this, yeah. With U12. Of course, the dead test. Okay, screen RAM bad. U24, it says, is bad. That's a, another RAM chip that's across the way from U12. It's not U12. Is that it? Are we uh, are we done? The CIAs are, are telling time, so that's something. All right. I guess it can't go any further than this. Yeah. Yeah. These aren't these aren't um, MT or MOS, and yeah, these are OK RAM, so they're not as failure prone. Let me see been running for a while now yeah the only other thing um, uh, that's suspect here and turn this back off the only other thing that's suspect is that we have these two MOS 7708 chips these are LS logic chips made by MOS so um, yeah we can try swapping the PLA I mean I've got the modern one right here but the most likely suspect, like Kevin is saying, if it's not the RAM, if the, the dead test is telling us two different RAM chips here, um, and none of them feel hot, and none of them are made by, you know, MT or, or MOS tech or anything like that, um, it, it's possibly one of these MOS made uh, 74LS logic chips here. We can start probing these guys with the power on and seeing if all of those uh, lines look okay. But I mean, it's cheap and easy to, to flip. Um, the uh, the PLA here, so 
let's let's just do that just for fun. Um, I'll use my modern PLA replacement. This thing is so soft and uh, loosely inserted into that socket, it barely requires any force to take it out. Hold on now, guys. Let's take a look here. There's the CPU, there's the uh, CIAs. This is U17 is the PLA. This is U17 right here that I'm looking at that I just pulled the PLA chip out of. Okay, all right. Let me put my replacement PLA in. I thought I saw something. I thought I saw something, but I don't. Um, here's the plankton. Plankton is now inserted with the dead test. And we still don't have the kernel ROM installed. Let's just see what happens with that, that situation. Yeah, that PLA socket is definitely well loved, for sure, for sure. Okay, all right. Let's see if we still get RAM errors. Hey Noah, glad you could join us. Thanks for coming by. We are working through this together. Oh, we're getting a, uh, a RAM test here, guys. This is different. It didn't do this before with the original PLA. I like where you guys' are, heads were at with this. This is definitely worth, uh, worth testing. We're getting further than we got before with the stock PLA. Haha, <laughs> screen RAM passed. All right, color RAM. So yeah, it had already locked up by, by this point. Yeah, Don, your uh, C64 bin has brought uh, all the boys to the yard. <laughs> uh, all right. Yes, we have gotten so much farther than we got before. I don't know what it's doing at this moment, but we are so much farther than we were before. It's time to put the original kernel ROM back in and see if the dead test still works. Okay, RAM test, okay. Wait for this, oh, there's no SID. There's not gonna be a sound test, no SID. But we passed all of the tests with the dead test with the replacement PLA. Okay, I'm putting in the original kernel ROM again, and we're gonna run through. We think this is bad, but this is going to be the ultimate test. It may not be bad. We may not get a colored screen at all. Because remember when I said 15 minutes ago, when I see a solid color, it always tells me there's a PLA problem. And I don't take my own advice. Okay, kernel ROM is in. No solid color. And we're, 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 we're booting the dead test with the kernel ROM in place for the first time. Dual PLA chip in the bin. I didn't see, but I can go have a look. Okay, awesome. So with everything here, let's take out the dead test, guys. Dead test is out. Do we get a basic prompt? Place your bets. Ha ha, yes, we have a working machine. Okay, so the character ROM is good. The kernel ROM is good. The basic ROM is good but we had a dead 6510 CPU and we had a dead PLA. And together, you can't have a working 64, right? Yeah, it's a bummer that the, uh, the CPU is dead. PLA is expected, CPU not expected. Oh, all right, very cool. Let's see if we can find a spare PLA from the bin. See if we can find uh, one that we can pull off of a, a, a spare machine here. Um, otherwise, uh, we're going to run through the full diagnostic next with the diagnostic harness and see where we're at. So let me have a rummage around really quickly, see what I can find. Stay tuned. Yep, 
Yeah, there are no spare chips hanging around in the bin. I mean, there's a whole bunch of machines here. Let me see what my parts machine has on it. Parts machine does not have a spare PLA on it. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a spare PLA to use at all. Um, but that said, we have a whole bunch of other 64s here. We can pop one open and see if there's a PLA. Um, but yeah, let's put the full dead test. We'll put the full diagnostic harness on this bad boy, and we'll run the full um, full test suite. Let's see what happens. All right. And uh, what was this? Oh, this is the original PLA. So I'm going to take this before I forget, guys. Of course, this is the most important thing. Here's the original PLA. We're going to get out the Sharpie once again. Get out the Sharpie once again. And big old X on the PLA. Okay. There it goes. That's done. All right. Wheel you guys back out here. All right. So what I've got is I've got the, uh, the full diagnostic harness. Built this a long time ago. all out. This is a great uh, tool to have if you're going to be repairing 64s. Yeah, I don't repair a lot of 64s, so I don't have a lot of spare parts. Um, I've very rarely done anything like this before. So um, let's see here. So that goes there. Okay. And this goes on the tape port here, like so. All right. This is the keyboard dongle and it is keyed goes on like a so and then we have two game ports this is a uh, controller two that and um this is controller one plug that in there and then that goes and these are all keyed you can only put them in one way all right there we go. Um, so we've got the full harness installed. Now what I could do is I could flip around some uh, dip switches on here and change this from a dead test to a diag cart. But uh, easier for me just to put in the ultimate. We've got the ultimate in. And uh, turn it on. See, hopefully it boots up. Oh, one more thing. I need the, uh, the, um, the shunt for the IEC port here, the little loopback connector. There we go. All right. Here we go. Let's flip this on and see if it comes up to basic again, which it should. Okay, good. Now, um, oh, haha, ha, uh, guys. Um, yeah, so I made a mistake. I need a keyboard because the ultimate cartridge requires you to type a few things, right? You can't just, you can't just boot into a thing unless you've configured it to boot into a thing. So let's boot into a thing. All right. So now we have a keyboard attached. What I'm going to do, oh, my keyboard's backwards. That won't help. Um, here in Flash, I've got the diag cart. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to copy the diag cart to Flash. That'll put it into the Flash storage of the, the cartridge. And then if I go to F2 and I go to uh, C64 cartridge setting, I can set the cartridge to be, you know, the diag cart, save it to flash, and then when I reboot the machine, it should come up to the diag test. So now I can put the keyboard uh, loopback connector back on, and now it should default to the diagnostics when I turn the machine on. Yes, okay, it does. It almost seems like I know what I'm doing <laughs> some of the time, with all of your help. <laughs> Uh, let's see what this looks like full screen. Keep in mind, there's no SID on this, so it's going to fail the controller tests, and it's going to, of course, fail the SID tests. Huh. It says the kernel ROM is bad. That's interesting. Why would it say the kernel ROM is bad when it boots just fine? Do you think the kernel ROM is marginal? 
All right. Control port is expected. Yeah, I could have used USB on the Ultimate, or I could have used the Telnet interface to control it remotely, but this works too. Oh, okay, kernel test is hard-coded checksum, so it's possible that the uh, the checksum isn't matching, because this is this kernel ROM, as we saw before, this kernel ROM that we saw before here is the only one that's made by a different manufacturer. It doesn't look original to this machine. This kernel ROM looks um, like an aftermarket thing. So um, I'm not too arsed about that, considering it does boot uh, up to the machine just fine. So yeah. But um, control port and user port, um, yeah, that's weird. The SID does not affect the user port. The SID does affect the control port because it can't test the pots, right? So yeah, it's saying 6526 and U1 and U2 are bad. Um, what we do when that happens is we flip them around and see if the problem goes somewhere, but but um, that's very strange. Yeah, it's possible that these don't work. Um, I mean, we didn't try loading anything from a, from a disk. We didn't try the controller ports. Yeah. Let me, uh, let's pop them out and uh, throw some deoxid in there. If not, I can, uh, I can change them out for known good CIAs and see if that resolves the problem. Because I have uh, CIAs in my, my ZIF machine. Yeah, okay. So let's do that. Let's just throw some deoxid at these guys real quick. I did not remove either of these chips yet. No, I did. We did. We removed them at the very beginning. These are not as common for, as the PLA failure, but since we had a CPU failure and a PLA failure, it's quite possible that this machine had some sort of overvoltage situation. Um, you know, we might have run in encountered that so well, this is the first thing we can do all right let's slap these back in there this really is the c64 from hell you know it'd be nice if uh, you know it was just one failure all right we'll turn it back on here we go see if that made any difference if it doesn't we'll swap the uh, the cia's from a good machine. Deoxid the port connectors. Okay. Uh, these guys here. Yeah. Good good call. What you can't see is that the uh, the tape drive light is coming on when it's testing things. Um, so it looks like that's doing, that's working at least. That's controlled by the uh, CPU though, not the uh, CIAs, right? Yeah, 6581's missing. We don't have that at all in this board. Yeah, I don't even have any modern replacements. I did, but I used them. All right, so U1 and U2, 6526, still showing up as bad. Um, ARM SID, ARM SID does, FPGA SID does, SWIN SID does not do paddles. So it depends on the one you get. I would stay away from the SWIN SID. It doesn't sound very good anyway. So, yep, let me clean the... I didn't swap the CIAs, I just took them out and I cleaned, I, I sprayed contact cleaner and then I put them back in, yeah. Um, what I'm gonna do is, yeah, I'm gonna take out the uh, the connectors here. Let me show you what I'm doing. Uh, keep forgetting to switch the camera, switch the camera view. I'm gonna take out these connectors. Okay, put a little deoxid on there. Flip the board up, get the other side, and I'm going to get a um, get a Q-tip here. I'm just going to wipe them, wipe them down a bit. They are corroded quite a bit. It's a lot of oxidation. Um, you know, can you see that? Yeah, there's a lot of oxidation on there. So let me. Uh, 
on the back side as well. Now that's looking better. Yeah, it was looking pretty gross before. Um, yeah. All right. Good call. Good call. Let me put the uh, the bits back on here. Okay. It's easier when this thing's in a case. The ports are really stiff. I guess it's probably just the connectors on my harness, but all right. Uh, let's fire it up again. Let it roll. Yeah, harness works properly. I've used it many, many times before. It's not janky at all. The harness works. Um, the harness works. Uh, never had a problem with it. Well, we're waiting. I'll drop a note. Nope. Nope. Uh, okay. U1 still bad. U2 not bad now. Interesting. Kernel ROM still bad. But again, that's just the checksum, and this is not the stock kernel ROM that's on here. Um, okay. Let's swap around the CIAs. One of them got better with the deoxit. The other one says bad. So I'm going to swap them around, and let's see if the error on U1 moves to U2 or not. That's what we want to see. So let's swap them around and see if the error on U1 moves over to U2. And if that's the case, then either we need to do some more cleaning or we really do have... Oh, hold on, guys. Hold on. The problem was with U1, was it? Was the problem with U1? See, this is what happens when you're when you're working on something on YouTube, and you're not very close to where you are. You see that? Yeah. There's a there's a, a leg, right there, bent leg. It wasn't in the socket. So <laughs> let's put them all in and make sure we don't have any bent legs. Now, I probably did that when I reinstalled it. However, yep, bent pin. However, Commodore machines have been known to have bent pins, missing legs, um, and all that from the factory, right? Yeah, so, oops, hold on. Got to put the keyboard test back on. Just, we know that's working. Okay, so, yeah, I'm sure I caused that problem. But uh, Commodore has made those uh, those mistakes from the factory, and some of them have run for their entire service lifetime with those those bent pins or missing legs somehow, and worked. Yeah, yeah, uh, ARM SID and FPGA SID are the ones you guys should look at if you want a replacement SID. There are actually there's um uh, there's another one. EV makes one now too. Um, the uh, the back bit, uh, back SID. I haven't checked it out yet, um, but that's another option, back SID. Okay, guys, U1, U2 are good. Uh, 6581 is missing, um, and everything else is checking out. So the kernel ROM we know is weird because it's not the factory ROM. Everything else on this board is now as good as it's going to get until we can get a replacement SID into this thing. Um, and, you know, the kernel is what it is. So I think, I think we're going to call this board um, as repaired as it can be. So let's write down what has happened so far with this machine. First of all, we had a bad 6510. Okay, we had a bad PLA. We have a missing 6581 um, and the kernel checksum. But that's, 
because it is what it is. So I think we can call this board um, as good as it's going to get. This was truly the uh, the C64 from hell. Um, at least, you know, I have all this stuff. Uh, <laughs> I have all this stuff ready to go to desolder and to, um, you know, I've got the hot air station and everything's all set up to be able to repair, you know, bad RAM chips or bad MOS chips on the board, desoldering everything. Um, but as it turns out, we didn't need to do any of that. Everything that was broken was socketed. So this board um, is now at least functional. Um, <laughs> Kimura says, I have to confess, I found this board inside a box buried under a stone slab that had a pentagram. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Well, it is very, it, it could use a cleaning. It could use a thorough cleaning. Um, you know, if you want to get in there with uh, some IPA and a brush or maybe a, a static, anti-static vacuum, that would be nice. You need to get yourself a PLA and a SID replacement of some sort. And then you'll have a, a fully working uh, 250425 longboard C64. Now, um, the question is, we've been going for almost two hours. Yeah, we've been going for almost two hours, guys. I really wanted to get to two or three machines today, but this one took the entire stream. So I think what I'm trying to say is, if you guys are up for it, we'll have to do this again. You know, same place, same bat time, some other weekend. because. There's a lot more machines to repair, and we didn't get nearly as far today as I had hoped we would. But I think we did pretty good with all of your help. We were able to figure out what was wrong with this machine. We learned a few things today, namely that there's a uh, one mega ohm resistor in the anti-static strap, so you can't do a continuity check on that. Um, also, we learned that um, pin six and seven on the MOS 8701 are not the same thing. So we have to uh, make sure we're on the right pin when we're probing with the oscilloscope. Uh, what else did we learn today? Um, that, no, there's definitely something else that someone pointed out that was very important that I did not know. Um, even TJ didn't know. What was it that you didn't know, TJ? Um, something about, um, huh. oh, well, the, the 10X and 1X, make sure your 10X and 1X probe on the, uh, the scope is correct. We learned that today. Um, that's why the signals look so tiny um, when they weren't. So yeah, we learned a whole bunch of stuff uh, and more. So yeah, we'll have to do it again. I appreciate you guys joining me today. This was a lot of fun, a little bit stressful uh, because you start off not knowing anything that's wrong with this. This is literally the first time I've looked at any of these machines. I didn't do any prep work for this, so um, it is what it is. But um, yeah, I think the best course of action is to uh, pick up and do this again with another machine that hopefully will just be a bad RAM chip or a bad PLA or something that we can easily diagnose uh, without spending two full hours doing it. So, um, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's good to have the right, um, the right uh, manual for the board that you're working on, too. I got lucky. I pulled up the right one on the first try. But, um, yeah, thank you guys so much for, uh, for your help. Uh, wouldn't have been able to do it without you. I really mean that when I say that, too. Um, I learned a bunch of stuff today, and um, with your guys' help, we were able to use some, some smarts, some process of elimination, some probing, uh, swapping stuff out, trying things, um, and we got to a good place in the end. So thank you so much for all of that. Um, I think we uh, will have to do this again if you guys are willing and able. So yeah, thanks very much. Uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Have a great Sunday, and um, we will get back together and look at some more C64s. Maybe a short board, maybe a 64C next time. So uh, yeah, thanks very much, and we will see you next time. Good night.